Tonight on Fox 45 News at 10, shocking body camera video from an encounter last night where an officer was shot. What it reveals about the confrontation with one suspect. And then puts the mouthpiece of his cigar in her A controversial class assignment. Why some parents are defending a book so racy, we can't read all of it to you. But first tonight, breaking news that we've been following all evening. An earthquake in Delaware felt hundreds of miles up and down the East Coast, including right here in Baltimore. Here's a live look at the map from the U.S. Geological Survey. As you can see, this quake east northeast of Dover, Delaware, about 445 this afternoon. Our Shelly Orman has been following this story all evening. That's right. Shelly joins us live from Hamden right now with more. Shelly. Well, Kai and Jennifer, my photographer and I, we were in downtown Baltimore. We were actually inside of City Hall getting ready to do an interview when we felt the earthquake, and we weren't sure what it was. It was very brief, but it had us kind of turning to each other, and we were asking, did you feel that? Well, it turns out a lot of you were asking that question today. I was actually in my office, and I noticed there a shaking. We felt a big shake and kind of a noise. Yeah, I felt it. I was in a Metro PCS store and I felt it. A 4.1 magnitude earthquake. It occurred off the coast of Dover, Delaware around 4.45 Thursday. Tremors were felt across Baltimore. It was just like a real shaky, real quick. No, like that. As I immediately called or I texted her and I said, did you feel that earthquake? That question being asked all around. Oh, so you felt it? The shaking lasted seconds. Maybe a second and a half. Many weren't sure what it was. I thought it was someone dropping the plotter paper on the hardwood floor. I assumed it was our washer dryer because I'd put some like big blankets in it, so I just passed it off as nothing. The impact here was minimal. No damage reported. Many didn't notice a thing. I called my family because I'm from Delaware, and they, uh, they didn't feel it funny enough. I work up in Towson. No one noticed anything at all. It was not even a shake, no tremors, nothing. Everybody was saying stuff like, did you feel that earthquake? I was like, we had an earthquake? I didn't even know there was an earthquake that happened. Feel it or not, the earthquake provided plenty to talk about tonight. We weren't expecting it, so we're pretty proud to have survived our first earthquake. <laughs> no damage. Yeah. It, you would think we would feel Also that. giving some something to joke about. You know, MEMA is monitoring for reports of damage, and if you felt it, you can report where you were and what you felt to the U.S. Geological Service. We have put a link on how to do so on our website at foxbaltimore.com slash newslinks. Live tonight in Hamden, Shelly Orman, Fox 45 News. Shelly, thank you. Earthquakes like the one today bring back memories of the quake six years ago. The epicenter of that quake was near Mineral, Virginia. That's northwest of Richmond. That earthquake did cause damage here in downtown Baltimore. It sent workers running into the streets and jammed cell phone networks. Several landmarks were damaged. St. Patrick's Roman Catholic Church on Broadway suffered damage and cracks formed in the ceiling of the Baltimore Basilica. It took nearly two years to fix. Continuing our coverage now of this earthquake that hit near Dover, Delaware, we are joined by Yana Persley of the U.S. Geological Survey. Thank you for being with us. Hello. What can you tell us about what happened today? This is a fairly unusual event, right? It is an unusual event. It's rare to be this big in that area. Since about the 1990s, we had magnitude 3 or larger. Only about three of those happened around the region. It's shallow, so it was felt quite uh, far distance from the epicenter. And how far is that? We're hearing from New York and certainly here in Baltimore. I have seen felt reports for up to 200 miles away. Are we likely to feel anything else? Could there be aftershocks from this? Yes, there could be aftershocks. We have not seen any, but we're going to keep out looking for them. Well, we certainly in this area, it's not unprecedented. We had an earthquake back in 2011 that hit near uh, Richmond, Virginia. As rare as it is, uh, it has happened before. How does this compare to what happened in Richmond or near Richmond in 2011? This earthquake is a lot weaker. Um, the Richmond earthquake caused considerable damage and it injured people. This one, I would not expect any uh, large damage outside, perhaps some weak cracks in foundation, cracks in the driveways in the epicenter area, but not farther away. Still, what is the message, what's the takeaway for our viewers tonight, uh, just knowing that this, this can happen? We're not immune to earthquakes. That's correct. The earthquakes can happen anytime and anywhere. And no place can be, can be said that really has not had or will not have earthquakes in the future. And what should people do very quickly to prepare? 
I believe you should go on the USGS website and look, make sure you know what to do in earthquake emergency. All right, Yana Persley from the USGS, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you. Breaking news tonight in Prince George's County. One person is rushed to the hospital after a small plane crashes in Bowie. It happened about 6.20 this evening. The pilot was making his final approach to Freeway Airport on a flight from Ocean City. Maryland State Police say the plane made contact with trees near the airport, causing it to overturn and crash. The pilot had non-life-threatening injuries and has not been identified. New information about Detective Sean Souter. The information all revealed in a new indictment against one of the nine federally indicted Baltimore police officers. According to that indictment, seven years ago, Detective Souter was set up by Officer Wayne Jenkins. Here's what Police Commissioner Kevin Davis had to say about Detective Sean Souter's involvement in that case. Detective uh, Souter was, was used. He was Officer Souter at the time. He was used and he was put in a uh, position uh, uh, in, where he unwittingly uh, recovered drugs that had been planted by another police officer. And that's a, that's a, that's a damn shame. That, that really, really is. Well, we have complete coverage of the Sean Suter investigation and the new indictment of Wayne Jenkins. We start with the story you're seeing first on Fox. Crime and justice reporter Joy LaPola with an exclusive one-on-one -on -one interview with the state's acting U.S. attorney done minutes after the Jenkins indictment was announced. These additional charges stem from a police pursuit back in 2010 that ended in a crash and a police officer's father ultimately dying. In a one-on-one -on -one interview, Maryland's acting U.S. attorney talks about Detective Sean Souter's role in securing this new indictment against Sergeant Wayne Jenkins, an officer already indicted on racketeering charges. When we talk about this case, Officer Sean Souter was involved in it. He was one of the officers. He was the officer who Jenkins allegedly sent back to the car to find the drugs after they were planted. Was this the case that Detective Souter was supposed to offer grand jury testimony in? He was being subpoenaed, he was subpoenaed to the grand jury to give information about what he knew about um, um, that incident. Do you think that Detective Sean Souter's murder was the result of him being scheduled to appear before the federal grand jury? I, I don't have any uh, evidence to, to suggest that's the case. Is the federal government involved in investigating his death? Well, I, I, I can say that the FBI is uh, providing a lot of support to the Baltimore City uh, police who are investigating uh, the incident. Is it fair to say that Wayne Jenkins set up Sean Souter in this case? Well, I wouldn't, I mean, you can characterize it any way you want. Um, I don't know whether I would say that he set him up. Uh, um, the, the, he put him in a bad position. Our um, the indictment alleges that uh, Jenkins planted the evidence, wrote a false report, um, uh, characterizing this incident in a way that wasn't true. Because the essential untruth is is that those two fellows didn't have that were charged um, didn't have heroin. Federal authorities believe Wayne Jenkins planted those drugs in an effort to steer attention away from the role he played in the police pursuit. In downtown Baltimore, Joy LaPola, Fox 45 News. Well, the two men in prison for selling drugs after Officer Wayne Jenkins planted them had their convictions overturned. Umar Burley and Brent Matthews pled guilty in 2011 to selling drugs in the federal case. Matthews had been released from jail when his conviction was overturned, but Burley was still there. Burley was released last August. A third Baltimore police officer was listed in today's indictment, along with Wayne Jenkins and Sean Souter. Named officer number two in the indictment, he was riding with Wayne Jenkins when the car they were chasing crashed. Jenkins is accused of planting drugs in that car that crashed. Officer number two is a former member of the gun trace task force, which Jenkins led when he was indicted in March. Fox 45's Joy LaPola asked the acting U.S. attorney about this officer. I don't know, I don't know anything about this particular police officer uh, other than the information he gave. Uh, uh, in connection with our, our investigation, our, our, our assistance in the FBI um, credited his, his, his testimony. 
The officer works at the police academy and has not been charged with any wrongdoing. Well, new calls tonight from top city officials to have the FBI investigate the death of Detective Sean Souter. A lot of questions remain about his killing two weeks ago, and City Council President Jack Young and Councilman Brandon Scott say although they have confidence in the Baltimore City Police, it would be beneficial to have the help of an outside agency. We, we also want to make sure that uh, we protect um, his family. Um, you know, because they watch the news and they see all this stuff going on and all the theories that's out there um, that people are saying. And I hope none of it is true, you know, but I think having the FBI as the lead investigative organization will give the citizens of Baltimore a level of comfort that, you know, the police are not policing the police. And this sheer fact that he was a federal witness and scheduled to testify the next day is enough for us to turn it over. And I think that you, you, if when you remove uh, the, the police department itself from the investigation, it helps to work towards uh, uh, a result that everyone can understand. Well, many people are hopeful that there will be more answers in the death of Detective Sean Souter tomorrow. As you know, the funeral for Detective Souter was held yesterday, exactly one week after he was shot. Well, police say they'll have a news conference about the case tomorrow, but Commissioner Kevin Davis says that there are a few things that he needs to do first. Out of respect for this organization, out of respect to the Souter family, I have to have conversations uh, with the Souter family before I speak publicly about their dead loved one. And I, I will have those conversations in anticipation of tomorrow's press conference, and I haven't had them yet. Police say they'll announce the exact time of that news conference tomorrow morning. Well, there is still much more news ahead on Fox 45. The long road to recovery. The Maryland victim of the Las Vegas shooting massacre working toward getting her life back. And tonight, in honor of her birthday, a huge outpouring of support to help her along her journey. Also ahead, questionable assignment at one Baltimore City school, a book so controversial, we can't read parts of it to you or we get fined. Watch, 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 watch. And chaos on the streets. We've got the police body camera view of what happened last night in Cherry Hill when a police officer was shot in the hand. It is a dramatic glimpse into the life and death situations that officers find themselves in on the violent streets of Baltimore. And it looks like we have a line of showers moving in from the west as we continue to see a little bit of rain pushing through Baltimore. Mainly the heaviest showers on the eastern shore now. We'll continue to see some clearing through the overnight. I will look ahead to how your day is going to shape up for tomorrow and your weekend outlook coming up in my forecast. Baltimore police released new video of the body camera footage from yesterday's shooting where an officer was shot in the hand. We're going to show you one angle of that shooting, and we want to warn you that the scene is intense, but it demonstrates how quickly things unfolded. Watch, 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 That's police work happening in real time. It didn't happen on a videotape. The shooting happened last night in Cherry Hill, hours after the funeral of Detective Sean Souter. John Rydell has reaction to the video as well as details about the suspect. Watch, 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 watch him, watch him, watch him. Oh, we're in the, 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 we're in Police body cameras reveal the violent confrontation. During the scuffle, the officer is shot in the hand, but the screams come from the suspect when he is tased. These things happen very, very quickly. Uh, it's a matter of seconds. It's a violent struggle, and thank God we're not uh, talking about planning another police funeral. 35-year-old Alan Hosea Johnson Jr. now faces at least 10 charges, including attempted first-degree murder. 
Police recovered a 40 caliber handgun from Johnson, as well as heroin and crack cocaine. We have an armed gunman walking around the community, and, you know, Lord only knows what his intention was with that firearm. And police say because Johnson was already a convicted felon, it was illegal for him to possess a weapon. We're talking about a gun offender on the street, free to harm people. Those are the people that we believe should have mandatory consequences to those actions that are harming people in our city. So despite that confrontation, police are grateful that this three-year police veteran escaped serious injury. In Baltimore, John Rydell, Fox 45 News. Well, you can see the entire news conference online. Go to foxbaltimore.com slash raw news. A specialist says the Baltimore officer shot in the hand during that violent arrest may have years of rehab ahead of him. Last night, Commissioner Kevin Davis said the bullet went through the palm of the officer's hand. Dr. Ryan Katz, an orthopedic hand surgeon at MedStar Hospital, said gunshot wounds often have a wide zone of destruction. It's not enough if you have a fracture just to get the fracture to heal. You have to get the hand working. So with these injuries in particular, you see many of these structures injured at the same time. Well, the officer is receiving treatment from a specialist at shock trauma. New tonight, a jury finds an undocumented immigrant accused of killing 32-year-old Kate Steinle in 2015 on a San Francisco pier, not guilty of murder, but convicted him on a felony firearm charge. Jose Inez Garcia Zarate uh, has, been de has been deported five times and was wanted for a sixth deportation when he was arrested for murder. Well, during his campaign, Mr. Trump blamed sanctuary city laws for Kate Steinle's death. Garcia Zarate said he found the gun and that it went off in his hand. Jim Neighbors, the actor who famously portrayed Gomer Pyle on The Andy Griffith Show, has died. Neighbors rose to fame after joining The Andy Griffith Show in the early 1960s and later got his own spin-off show. Neighbors' husband says the 87-year-old died peacefully this morning at their home in Hawaii. His health had been declining for the past year. In Mount Washington, the Baltimore City Fire Department is kicking off the season with its annual train garden. That's right. It's the 62nd year of the firefighters of Engine 45 and their families creating the holiday scene. With more than 800 hours spent making the train garden, it's sure to be one of the best. Baltimore, you got to come and see this. It'll bring tears to your eyes. The uniqueness, the, the meticulousness of all of this display, it, I, I don't think anybody else could do this. Nobody could do this but engine 45. Well, the station is encouraging you to bring your kids to see the trains, get on the fire trucks, and take pictures with the firefighters. By the way, that display will be open daily until January 9th. And it is really great to see. I want to see that. Yeah, you have to get there. You should take the girls. Okay. It's a lot of fun. All right, time now for a check of our weather forecast. Here's meteorologist Vita Sri. And I'm a big train buff. I love model trains as a kid. I always would love to see the scenery like that. I'm definitely heading over there, Kai. Okay? We're going to do this. Let's do it. Definitely. <laughs> anyway, here's a take a looking at uh, what's going on outside right now. On HD radar, we had a little line of showers, which was expected right on time, actually, right around 9 o'clock, pushing through the area. Most of the heaviest rain now remaining on the eastern shore. Still a few little sprinkles around Baltimore down towards Prince George's County, but really the heaviest activity moving east of Queenstown. Some heavy activity there up towards Centerville, going up uh, uh, the coast here, up towards Sutlersville, as well as Chestertown. Churchill getting some decent showers, heading over into Delaware, a little bit of heavy rain just south east of Cecilton and Galena. So definitely this rain will continue to move on off to the east and leave us with uh, cooling temperatures uh, from the northwest. 51 degrees in Baltimore right now, 46 in Cumberland, back in Pittsburgh sitting at 43 degrees. Starting off tomorrow morning, you need your jacket. Looking at cooler temperatures, 8 a.m., about 42 degrees. The sun will return. Looking at temperatures right around 49 at lunchtime, 52 are high. So it's going to be a cool Friday, but it looks like we'll see nice, dry, sunny conditions for the weekend. I'll time it out for you coming up in my forecast. Not comfortable reading it out loud to a man, I don't know. It's a gritty and critically acclaimed story about a kid's life on the streets of Philadelphia. But many feel this narrative, written by a Morgan State University professor, is too raw for kids to read. The controversy coming up. Another day of reckoning. Who's accused of bad behavior now? An entertainment mogul steps down, politicians dig in their heels, and the accusations keep flying. The recovery of Tina Frost, the medical struggles she's endured since being shot in the Las Vegas massacre. Her amazing progress and the outpouring of support she received tonight in honor of a special day in her life.
The University of Stanford is researching the brain of Las Vegas mass murderer Stephen Paddock. The Las Vegas Review Journal reports that a pathologist will test for defects like dementia and CTE. Experts don't know if they'll be able to make any useful findings because Paddock was shot in the head. But any shred of information could help investigators understand why he opened fire on 22,000 concert goers in October. Well, one of the victims of that massacre, Tina Frost, is just about to celebrate her 28th birthday. But as Kathleen Karen reports, the Las Vegas shooting victims' medical progress right now is even a bigger celebration. At the Green Turtle... We're here to help, and we want to make things better for them. 20% of the proceeds from today's sales will go to Tina Frost's medical expenses. There's things crazy that happen every day. There's no way to describe it. What happened? Tina was injured during the mass shooting in Las Vegas. The 27-year-old has had three major surgeries, including one just 10 days ago, where surgeons perform bone reconstruction in the forehead and around the eye. I can't imagine the heartache the family is going through. Tina's struggle to recover resonates with residents in her home state, especially with Daryl, retired Army. And to me, she's just like a soldier fighting back from a, a combat injury. So, you know, she, she's a soldier. Tina's medical bills continue to soar, but it's unclear how long she will have to be in rehab. Yeah, my bill is low, and I would, wanted to give a little more to the 20%. Uh, is there a way that I can donate a little more? Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I had a few other guests ask me the same question. On Saturday, Tina turns 28 years old. Patrons here hope her next year is better. In Anne Arundel County, Kathleen Cairns, Fox 45 News. More news still ahead on Fox 45 News at 10. It's finally over. A killer hurricane season. We knew it was bad. Tonight, we break down the numbers, the shocking damage totals after this season of disastrous storms. Stepping up the rhetoric against North Korea, how the U.S. is responding after the latest missile launch and what our ambassador is saying will happen to the rogue nation if they make the wrong move. And then puts the mouthpiece of his cigar in her language so raw we have to bleep it we're not talking about an x-rated movie we're talking about a book that could be in your child's classroom right now the controversy surrounding it why some parents say it's teaching all the wrong lessons and we're looking at cooler temperatures moving in as the rain pushes on off to the east but the rain is gonna move out of here it looks like we have some clearing up for tomorrow i'll show you how long you'll be able to use those sunglasses and uh, when you're gonna need those winter coats to come on out as some cold air moves in here and there. Coming up next in my forecast. New at 1030, a teacher's book choice is pulled from a Baltimore City High School classroom. Critics call the book brilliant and always engaging, but some parents believe some students are too young for what's inside the paperback. Our Keith Daniels is live at Digital Harbor High School where the teacher is learning a lesson. Keith? Well, Jennifer, the book is called Buck. The author is M.K. Asante. Now, it plays out the powerful events of his childhood on the mean streets of Philadelphia. A one-time drug dealer who's now a nationally recognized author, filmmaker, and professor at Morgan State University. And now tonight, controversy over Buck in the classroom. Do you have kids? Don't ask Sandy Dawson, a mother, an adult, to read four particular pages from this book called Buck. I'm not comfortable reading it out loud to a man, I don't know. But Liz Reinhardt, another parent, reads through the chapter with ease. He's smoking a black and mild. He blows the candles out, lights out, and then puts the mouthpiece of his cigar in her Buck, M.K. Asante's engaging memoir, a coming of age story with descriptive sexual language, so vivid, that if we read the unedited version out loud or show the words on TV, we'd be fine. But at Digital Harbor High School in South Baltimore, an English teacher thought the critically acclaimed book would be a good read for a ninth grade class, an assignment for students as young as 14 years old. I don't think the language is appropriate. Dawson's daughter is 10th grade. Still, she's a parent outraged over the assignment. A child is not allowed to go to a rated R movie. Um, why should they be able to read a, uh, a passage that has maybe rated X uh, language and, and actions in it? But Reinhardt is a mother defending the book. 
good literature is often disturbing. And it's particularly disturbing when it's cutting edge, when it's talking about things that society isn't willing to talk about right now. But that's when literature is most valuable. I think the teacher should have sent a letter home first to the parents to give permission. Well, the Baltimore City school officials, they've released this statement. They say Buck is not an approved part of the curriculum and will be replaced with a different text. We're live now in South Baltimore. Keith Daniels, Fox 45 News. Updates right now on three accusations of sexual misconduct. First, Def Jam co-founder Russell Simmons is stepping down from the companies he founded after he's accused of sexual assault. In a column published in The Hollywood Reporter, screenwriter Jenny Lamette says Simmons forced her to have sex with him in 1991. Simmons released a statement saying in part, quote, while her memory of that evening is very different from mine, it is now clear to me that her feelings of fear and intimidation are real. While I have never been violent, I have been thoughtless and insensitive in some of my relationships over many decades, and I sincerely and humbly apologize, end quote. Updates now on two politicians. House Speaker Paul Ryan and Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi are both calling on Democratic Congressman John Conyers to resign. It's been more than a week since sexual harassment allegations first surfaced against him. Today, the 88-year-old Michigan congressman ended up in the hospital because of stress. Also today, the Senate Ethics Committee says it has opened an investigation into Minnesota Senator Al Franken. Tonight, there's a fifth woman accusing Senator Al Franken of inappropriate behavior. So far, both he and Conyers have kept their jobs and avoided any punishment. We would like to ask you, do you think lawmakers who admit to sexual misconduct should resign from office? Tell us what you think by going to foxbaltimore.com slash vote. Results will update live. As the allegations add up, Chief Political Correspondent Scott Thuman shows us how some wonder if politicians see a double standard. Whether in the media or movies, accusations of misconduct more times than not have meant swift repercussions from firings to canceled contracts. So far, the same hasn't been said about Capitol Hill. Two prominent politicians, Congressman John Conyers and Senator Al Franken, both face allegations in the Me Too movement. And some colleagues have appeared defensive when asked about the different standards. Right? I don't know, you would have to give me some examples. Uh, Harvey Weinstein, Charlie Rose, Matt Lauer. I don't think they who would look at that. Right. Thursday, 10 days after the story on Conyers spread, a change of course. Congressman Conyers should resign. And if the facts are indeed what they appear to be, I think it's very clear that it'll be very difficult for him to continue. There. Are politicians held to different, more lenient standards? And is it voters who really have the final say in doling out punishment? We need to be looking strongly in the mirror, but Congress should not be exempting itself from any of the rules, any of the laws. Look, don't do anything that your mother, if she saw you doing it or heard you saying it, would disapprove. I mean, I think it's a simple rule, and uh, why some of these folks can't follow that uh, is beyond me. There are some consequences to these actions. On Thursday, Congressman Joe Barton announced he won't seek re-election after he admitted to sending racy texts to women while still married. On Capitol Hill, I'm Scott Thuman. And now back to our question of the day. Do you think lawmakers who admit to sexual misconduct should resign from office? Right now, a little more than 70% of you are saying yes. You can tell us what you think by going to foxbaltimore.com slash vote. Well, two state corrections officers are on the other side of the bars tonight, along with 24 other people charged in a major gang activity in the Maryland Correctional Facilities. Attorney General Brian Frosch announced the indictments today, naming correctional officer Sergeant Antoine Fordham as a high-ranking member of the 8 Trey Crip street gang and a lead in the corruption. Joy Lambert joins us from downtown with details. He bragged how easy it was to carry out the Crips activity. Attorney General Brian Frosch says correctional officer Sergeant Antoine Fordham was leading the violent 8 Trey Crips street gang both inside and outside prison walls. He told another co-conspirator in a recorded call, I'm going to tell you, cuz, the route I'm going, they're going to have to build a statue out there with my face on it. After a nearly year-long multi-agency investigation, 26 defendants were indicted, including Fordham's sister, nephew, and other correctional officer, Philip Jordan, and his mom.
Charges include attempted first-degree murder, gang activity, drug distribution, and smuggling contraband into the prison. He was basically running uh, operations for the eight trade Crips up in the northeast section of Baltimore um, after work and then going into work and, and basically providing direction to many of the inmates. Fordham was hired in 2006. The 35-count indictment connects him to violent gang activity since 2013. It's unclear when his association with the Crips began, but the indictment sends a clear message. We will fine you, we will arrest you, and prosecute you to the fullest extent of the law. In downtown Baltimore, Joy Lambert, Fox 45 News. Harlem Park residents are questioning the lawfulness of the police cordoning following the fatal shooting of Detective Sean Souter. Neighbors held a town hall tonight to discuss that issue. ACLU senior staff, uh, attorney David Roca, said police have the right to seal off a crime scene, but he disputed city police's decision to rope off several blocks, noting an appellate court decision on a similar police cordon in Washington, D.C. Police stops uh, at those checkpoints and questioning of uh, every person passing through and forcing them not only to prove their identity, um, but to prove that they had a legitimate reason for being there in the officer's discretion uh, violated the Constitution. David Roca says Baltimore police went beyond the scope of D.C. police because they stopped both foot and vehicle traffic. Well, it has been a particularly busy hurricane season this year, so we can all be grateful it's finally over. There was no shortage of activity, 17 storms receiving names, six growing to at least a Category 3 strength, damage estimates for the four storms that made landfall in the U.S., Harvey, Irma, Maria, and Nate, range between 300 and 475 billion dollars. But it wasn't the most active year on record. In 2005, 28 storms received names and 15 became hurricanes. Yeah, well, still good riddance. De devastating nonetheless, uh, no matter how you add it up. And it's going to be years for some of these islands uh, and even for Houston uh, and probably parts of Florida before they really get back on their feet. Absolutely. So difficult. Well, here's Chief Meteorologist Vetus Reed with a look at our weather forecast. And we did have some rain moving in tonight, Vetus. Yeah, we have some showers that are pushing through the area. The good news is that most of that activity is off to the eastern shore, moving into Delaware, and we'll continue to clear out as we go through the overnight. The remaining clouds out there will break, and we'll get some clearing late overnight. Skycam looking at the inner harbor lit up nicely there. Looks like we have those temperatures sitting at 51 degrees with winds being calm. Humidity low up there at 96%. It looks like we're seeing those temperatures cooling off as we go through the overnight, meaning tomorrow morning you're going to need those jackets because it will be on the cooler side of things starting our day off. Sitting at 45 degrees in Elkton, 45 Bel Air, 48 in Cockeysville, over in Westminster about 50 degrees, 48 in Columbia, down in Stevensville about 52 degrees, 53 in Annapolis, and down in Easton sitting at 53. And we saw a little warmer air down to the southeastern portion of the state's getting closer into the low 60s actually early, earlier today. Not too bad. We're still holding on to the southern flow, but the cold front is going to start transitioning these uh, arrows more from the northwest as we get into the next several hours here. So we'll have a northwesterly flow that's going to help those temperatures uh, be reinforced with a little cooler air behind the front. So here's the front on the weather map showing how that's going to continue to slide on off to the east. Showers are moving through and we'll continue to see the cooler temperatures move in behind that. High pressure back towards uh, St. Louis. A lot of real estate that has clear skies back to the west. That's what's going to be sliding into our area as we go through the weekend. That means dry, clear conditions. So Looks like what you'll be needing this weekend are two things that are important. You'll need those sunglasses, but also you'll need your coats because we're going to see actually cooler temperatures for highs for Friday and then into Saturday. Overnight temperatures, if you have plans out and about, it will be cold as we see temperatures in the 30s for overnight lows. Taking a look at the future scan, this system pushes off to the east. You can see those arrows from the northwest showing 8 a.m., a nice cool start to our day. Plenty of sunshine heading into the afternoon, coming home at 5 p.m., looking at dry conditions as well. And as we get into Saturday, looks nice. Like like a nice clear Saturday with uh, not much going on other than some sunshine out there for outdoor activities. And as we get into Sunday, it looks like we're going to continue to stay dry, uh, looking at very clear conditions all across the eastern seaboard, looking pretty good. This is noon on Sunday. Next chance for rain will start showing itself uh, up over parts of the Great Lakes region as we get into Monday. Won't reach here yet. We'll still be dry, but we'll get a chance for some rain building in and actually temperatures increasing ahead.
ahead of the front as you see these arrows showing a southerly flow. So that will all shift into our area as we get into Monday night, Tuesday. But Tuesday, temperatures go up just a tad bit, but then it also brings us a chance for rain. So here's what it looks like in the forecast down the road here, your extended outlook. Looks like we see on Friday, plenty of sunshine, 52 degrees, 49 on Saturday, plenty of sunshine. As we get to Sunday, as the Ravens are taking on the Lions downtown, looking at 53 degrees, 52 on Monday. Then we get into Tuesday, 50% chance for some showers moving into play. And uh, you can see that little bump in our temperatures getting close to 60 degrees. Rainy conditions on Wednesday. We cool back down behind that system with mostly cloudy skies. The cloudy skies on Thursday, high of 46 degrees. Back to you guys. All right, Jesus, thank you. Is Rex heading for the exit? The Secretary of State has been on the outs with the president for several months now, and rumors are boiling over in Washington that his days are numbered. Who might be up next for the high-level cabinet post? Stepping up the rhetoric against North Korea, how the U.S. is responding after the latest missile launch, and what our ambassador is saying will happen to the rogue nation if they make the wrong move. President Trump is lashing out at North Korean leader Kim Jong-un after the regime test another ballistic missile this week. At the same time, President Trump has taken steps to convince the regime to back off its nuclear weapons program. So far, nothing, including sanctions, appears to have had any effect in stopping North Korea from testing missiles. It doesn't look good right now. Uh, uh, Kim Jong-un is not responding to the kind of pressure that he should respond to. China must show leadership and follow through. China can do this on its own, or we can take the oil situation into our own hands. If war comes, make no mistake, the North Korean regime will be utterly destroyed. Ambassador Nikki Haley says North Korea's oil supply must be cut off. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov believes cutting off trade with North Korea is wrong. Lavrov accuses the United States of trying to provoke North Korea into taking another reckless action. President Trump is delaying one of his central campaign promises to move the U.S. Embassy in Israel to Jerusalem. To compensate, the president may declare Jerusalem the capital of Israel, a controversial move because Palestine claims the city is their capital. There is concern the fallout would hinder peace talks between Israel and Palestine the U.S. is trying to facilitate. The Trump administration says no decision has been made yet. But as I announced earlier this week, uh, President Trump is actively considering moving the American embassy from Tel Aviv uh, to Jerusalem. Well, the international community has previously agreed to resolve ownership of the city only after a, a peace agreement can be struck between Israel and Palestine. There are reports of a shakeup heading to the Trump administration. Fox News is reporting that plans are in the works to replace Secretary of State Rex Tillerson. Now, that change reportedly could happen in late January. There's speculation that if Tillerson is replaced, CIA Director Mike Pompeo would take his job. And some believe Arkansas Senator Tom Cotton, a staunch Trump supporter, would take Pompeo's job. Do you want Rex Tillerson on the job, Mr. President? He's here. Rex is here. Chief of Staff Kelly uh, called our department yeah. this morning yeah. and said that the rumors are not true. Well, White House spokesperson Sarah Sanders echoed that statement. Sanders said, when the president loses confidence in someone, they will no longer be here. Baltimore County police believe they stopped a possible campus shooting from happening today, or yesterday rather. Officers arrested 27-year-old Kenneth Sharp at the Community College of Baltimore County last night. Sharp was reportedly involved in a fight inside of a classroom. Police say he left and returned with a duffel bag. Inside the bag, a rifle and a loaded magazine. He also had ammunition in his pocket. He now faces assault and weapons charges. The National Christmas tree is glowing brightly near the White House. Four, three, two, one. Good job. Good job. Right. That's right. Following a countdown, President Trump counted and did that countdown with First Lady Melania Trump on the grounds uh, near the White House, then pushed a button to set the tree aglow with golden lights and silver stars. The annual event dates back to 1923 and President Calvin Coolidge. Today's show host Kathy Lee Gifford and actor Dean Kane hosted the televised lighting.
And it's looking beautiful, and uh, we are in the middle of the season now. We are. Even this weekend doesn't look that bad, Vetus. No, not at all. Just a little bit on the cooler side of things. It'll be a dry weekend, so you'll need to use those sunglasses each one of the days. Friday kicking off the weekend pretty decent at 52 degrees for our high. Overnight lows only in the 30s. Now, as we get into Saturday, we'll get more sunshine, 49 to 50 degrees, so it's even a little cooler below our normal high for this time of year, right around 50. And you're seeing uh, more sunshine for Sunday, 53 degrees with plenty of sunshine. So it looks like a pretty decent forecast going into the weekend, but it will be cooler, especially for the overnight activities or early morning jogs or runs. It will be a little bit of a chill in the air. Back to you guys. Thank you, Vita. It's coming up in 10 minutes on the late edition. An officer, an officer was shot in the hand during a rough arrest, the dramatic body cam video, and what the police commissioner is saying about the violent struggle. And Senate Republicans are on edge as they try to push through tax reform, the major setback the bill experienced tonight. There aren't a lot of believers in the Ravens offense this season, but their biggest fan is Joe Flacco. Why the Ravens quarterback test change is ahead in Sports Unlimited. Kicking the championship week off, Linganore Mill for Mill. After the Millers blew a 19 0 lead down with four minutes ago, Desmond Shell punches in the nine yard touchdown. Mill for Mill backed the lead by five, but the Lancers have one more comeback in them with seconds left. Devon Butler, the hero, touchdown Linganore, and the Lancers have their sixth state title, a Frederick County record 28 27 the final after an impressive comeback twice. After 12 weeks, 11 games, not much has changed for the Ravens offense. While better than average at six and five, and if the season ended today, they would be in the playoffs as a wild card. There's still so much doubt that surrounds this team. It's not special teams. It's not the defense. It's the other unit, the offense, the O-line, Joe Flacco, his targets. They own the worst passing offense in the league and next to last in total offense. At this point, they are who they are, but the Ravens are still holding out for change offensively direction we're trying to go is to be as good as we can be you know to try to put as many points up as we can put up play the winningest football that we can play you know we want to we want to produce in all three phases and I think we want to get more out of our offense and that's an ongoing process we've been trying to fight for that all year we're going to make it happen we got a little bit you know a little bit to go it's not it's not anything crazy um, but we definitely have the guys that can make some plays and 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 get us rolling so we're going to try to make it happen you can see the Ravens in their week 13 meeting against the Lions right here on Fox 45. They host Detroit Sunday as both teams try to fight and stay in that playoff hunt. Kickoff is set for one. Only six seasons in, kicker Justin Tucker just set a Ravens franchise record. That's at 1130 when Sports Unlimited continues. A gift fit for a king or queen coming up. How much it'll cost you to live in this castle near Scranton, Pennsylvania. Hello, I'm Mark Hyman. What's happened to ISIS? Here's what's happening behind the headlines. In 2014, President Barack Obama arrogantly dismissed the Islamic State as the JV team. Well, the JV team came perilously close to toppling Syria and Iraq. Obama's Arab Spring strategy included targeting the Syrian government. The chaos that ensued presented an opportunity for the Islamic insurgency. In a matter of months, it claimed about half of Syria and Iraq. Its leader announced a caliphate. At its peak, ISIS controlled territory that included about 10 million Syrians, Iraqis, and Kurds. It committed atrocities against Syrian troops, Christians, Kurds, Yazidis, just about anybody. People were slaughtered in the cruelest ways. Beheadings were routine. Public executions commonplace. Women were bought and sold as sex slaves. Children were trained to kill. It was the worst of mankind. In the last couple of years, U.S. and coalition forces increased anti-ISIS operations. The caliphate is now gone. The capital, Raqqa, has been liberated. The last ISIS stronghold along the Euphrates River Valley has fallen. Millions have been freed from its rule. The so-called JV team that caused so much human suffering is on the run. It's still a deadly insurgency, but it's diminished in power. 
and that's a good thing. To comment, go to BehindTheHeadlines.net. I'm Mark Hyman. Well, it might just be the perfect holiday gift for the princess in your life. How about a life-size <laughs> castle, complete with its own kingdom? Mm -hmm. This 15,000 square foot house near Scranton, Pennsylvania, wow. was modeled after a famous castle in Madrid, Spain. It has five bedrooms, five bathrooms, overlooks a lake, and comes with 25 acres. Pretty cool. It is a spectacular gift if you've got the cash. The property is currently listed for $1.69 million. Good evening, I'm Kai Jackson. And I'm Jennifer Gilbert. The big question being asked all around Maryland tonight is, did you feel it? And by that, we're referring to this afternoon's sudden, brief, and alarming earthquake. Seismologists are